Please won't you pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts find their way into the heart of God this morning. Amen. Our tongue is a fire, James says. Our tongue is a fire that sets a forest ablaze, James says. Our lives are literally filled up with an onslaught of on-fire words, yes? Many of them harmful and vitriolic. We are besieged by explosive rhetoric every day from our computers and our TV sets. But as our reading from James says, all of us make many mistakes, yes? Because we all have this remarkable little tool in our mouths. All of us. <laughs> Called the tongue. James compares the tongue to the small rudder of a very large ship. He says this tiny little organ has more power than all of the other organs in our bodies combined. The tiny rudder can guide gigantic ships through the wind and rain upon the vast ocean. James says that small and powerful tools like the tongue can also be shaped into weapons, though. The tongue is like a match. The entire forest can be set on fire by a tiny little flame. Powerful tool, that little tongue. Well, beloved, the forest is on fire. Rhetoric alone can burn down the whole republic if we let it. Our words can be used to deny the God-given inherent worth and dignity of every person. Our words can be used to destroy. All you have to do is read a comment section on the internet where humanity goes to die to know this. Right, Kristen? <laughs> All you have to do is turn on Fox News or Samantha Bee. All you have to do is turn on any form of media. Even our world leaders incessantly tweet out insults in 200 char 280 characters or fewer. We live in an increasingly connected and yet disconnected digital world in which we can so easily dehumanize those we cannot see and touch. When we observe and participate in this world of weaponized words, this virtual world, we feel hopeless, we feel depleted, we feel exhausted. Can I get an amen? And too often we respond with cynicism. Too often we respond with apathy. Too often we respond with despair. And that's why we need real face-to-face -face community like this one. This is why we need to come together with other real flesh and blood people who do not need to think alike, to love alike. Amen. That's why we need children filling our church building every Sunday, reminding us of the dreams for the world they're going to make. Our children can still close their eyes and see a million dreams. They minister to us. Not everyone should be teachers, our scripture says. Anne, who is a high school teacher, pointed out that she thought it was hilarious that she got to read that this morning. <laughs> because teachers will be judged with greater strictness. Amen. Amen. But you and I, everyone in this room, every single last one of us, even those of you who sit up in the balcony, <laughs> we are all called to be teachers each and every last one of us. We are the teachers. We aren't called to be perfect, but as a church community that spans multiple generations, we are called to be teachers because the children are watching. And teachers dream a world with their students. Right, teachers? 
So on this first day of Sunday School and High School Youth Fellowship and on this week when we welcomed the parents of almost 30 middle schoolers from our community into our, our, our whole lives, comprehensive sexuality program into our church, isn't that amazing? On this Sunday, I just want you to close your eyes for a moment. Close your eyes for a moment and dream a world where the reign of God has become real. A world in which heaven has touched down to earth. A world in which all are fed. A world in which our children are safe from harm. A world where all are free to be exactly who they are. A world in which all are loved. A world in which we walk before the Lord in the land of the living as our psalmist says. Now open your eyes and look around at the people in this room. New Englanders love it when I do this. <laughs> Especially after they've been crying because they listen to an eight-year-old sing a beautiful song, like pull at their heartstrings. Look around at the people in this room. Especially those with the red eyes from crying. These are your people. These are the people that you dream a world with. Your dreams should be darn near impossible on your own power. That's why we come here. Otherwise, they aren't dreams. They're just reasonable goals, right? We don't exist to think up reasonable goals here in the house of love. We exist to dream impossible dreams for the world we're going to make. Amen? Because we worship a God who makes the impossible possible. We worship a God who makes a way out of no way. We worship a God who has the audacity to take human imperfection and make it holy. That's the God we worship. We worship a God who created us and called us good, who promises extravagant love for us and everyone else, especially at our most unlovable. And beloved, we need to treat ourselves, ourselves especially, and one another as though that were true. As if goodness and lovableness is inherent and inerrant. Here's perhaps the greatest lie we were all told in grade school. Can you guess what it is? Can any of you guess? What's the greatest lie we were told in grade school? Le what? Your veins are blue. Your veins are blue. <laughs> that blood is blue, right. <laughs> That's good. The second one is? You're not lovable. You're not lovable. Yeah. There are no stupid questions, because there are stupid questions. <laughs> I love that one of our high school teachers just said that, too. Here's what I think the greatest lie is. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Those of us who have suffered the wounds of bullying or emotional abuse know that words can sometimes hurt far more than fists, right? Those of us who cannot shut up the inner critic inside of us, telling ourselves that we are not good enough, that we are worthless, we know how much harm words can do. Yes? Those of us who have spent the past few years watching the unity of our republic ripped to shreds, we know that words can bring down empires. Yes? We know what it, that it matters what we say and how we say it. And we are all hypocrites, every last one of us. As James writes in our scripture, we all bless the name of God whose other name is love with the same tongue that we use to curse those made in the likeness of God, which is every single person we encounter, right? So we see evidence of this hypocrisy every day. 
And we all know Christians who denigrate gay folks and undocumented immigrants and people who kneel for the national anthem before NFL games and Christians who express disdain for food stamps recipients and Christians who protest transgendered folks just trying to use the bathroom in peace. We all know those who condemn others made in the likeness of God by those who proclaim to be speaking for God, yes? But you and I, we are just as prone to condemn those who are made in the likeness of God with the same tongues we use to bless. We are not off the hook. Maybe you curse those who don't put the shopping cart back. (laughs) Yeah? Or the kid at school who relentlessly teases your son. Hell hath no fury like a mother scorned, amen? (laughs) Or the telemarketer just doing her job, (laughs) right? Or the neighbor with the wrong political sign, yeah? I, I literally bless people for a living, right? I say blessings over babies and marriages and intern ministers and lay leaders and Sunday school teachers and the ill and the dying. And then, then I get behind the wheel of the car and route two in rush hour traffic. (laughs) Just saying. (laughs) But luckily we have an example of perfection that we follow in Jesus. We know what a good word sounds like. The whole of the gospel or the good news of God can be summed up in Jesus's first ever sermon in the synagogue. Do you remember this sermon? It's okay because I'm gonna tell you what it is. He reads directly from the Hebrew scriptures, a short passage in his first sermon, drops the mic, right? And then sits down. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, which is today. James says our tongues are untamable, but I say he's wrong. I say we can challenge each other to use the gospel test. I say that we can ask ourselves, is the spirit of love reflected in the words I am about to say or type or think? Yes. Does what I'm about to say lift up the poor who may be myself or the impoverished or the spiritually impoverished or the immigrant or the widowed or the grieving or the losers or the maligned or the outcast? Is what I'm about to say enlightened and enlightening to others? Is it a word of freedom for all who are held captive by oppression and greed and what the Joneses think? Is what I'm about to say reflected of the million dreams I have for the world we're going to make? I think we can ask ourselves that before we speak. Or in simpler language, before I speak, am I applying the THINK acronym principles? Do you remember these? Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspired? Is it necessary? Is it kind? T-H-I-N-K. Beloved, we are called to be teachers. We will never be perfect, but we can think before we speak. We can, because we can do hard things. Though it may sound naive and out of style and hard sometimes, we're not giving up on the gospel here at First Church in Sterling. Can I get an amen? Today, I'm going to ask us to practice using our words to bless, okay? And I'm doing this because we need to bless someone else who needs a blessing this morning. Our Becky Conway, our Judy and Jim Conway's daughter, Judy who's here, our Emily who's here, our James and Laura's sister, our Charlotte's mother, needs a blessing, big time. She has accompanied her 18-month-old daughter, Charlotte, from Boston Children's, where she's lived for the past two months near her loving family. She's gone to Baltimore, where Charlotte is receiving treatment for a rare disease 
called acute transverse myelitis that has left her paralyzed from the neck down. She's 18 months old. She's ours. And so is Becky. And Becky feels lonely and Becky feels depleted and Becky feels tired. She's without her family and friends and partners and partner, sorry, and parents by her side. Her partner is Trevor. And she is strong as all heck, but she's so often alone and she's falling into despair. Isn't that right, Judy? Becky says, I have never experienced a pain like this, a feeling I can't even begin to describe. As Charlotte's mom, I feel as though I should be stronger and doing more. She says, I'm going back to being in that angry phase. Why do things like this happen? Why are we given such hard battles? I know most will say God gives his toughest battles to those who can handle them, but that's just hard to hear right now. Why do I now question God, she says. All my life, I grew up with my own beliefs. I didn't ever change them. Now I don't know what to think anymore. So my beloved friends, Paula Fogarty, had the grand idea to show her what God looks like, what God feels like, what God sounds like, because Paula Fogarty also knows what it's like to be ill and to have God show up in the form of people. Right, Paula? She's also here. <laughs> Becky needs our words of blessing and assurance from us of God's favor and protection. And my friends, she doesn't need to be told that God gives his toughest battles to those who can handle them. Isn't that right? She doesn't need to be told that. But that in the words of the psalmist, when we are brought low, we are saved by love. So let's show up for Becky with our words, okay? Let's help deliver Becky's soul from death, her eyes from death, her feet from stumbling. And let us do this by writing cards. You have those cards found in your bulletins. Let's write prayers of grace for her and for Charlotte. It doesn't matter if you know this family or not. I don't care. You know this family because you are part of the family of love. If you showed up this morning off the street for the first time, it doesn't matter. And we will collect your cards and we will put them in a box that Paula kept all her cards of support in when she was going to chemotherapy. It says, with God, all things are possible. Is that right, Paula? You can place your prayer for Becky and Charlotte in the offering plate during the offertory or in a basket on your way out of church. Let's use our tongues to bless this morning. Beloved, we can become our dreams for the world. We can be worthy teachers for our children. Love is the weapon we have in our arsenal to fight the devil, threatening to win our hearts and to control our tongues of fire. We can transform from people who succumb to the worst of who we are to people who live into the best of who we can be. The moral revolution this country needs is here, right here in this room. It foments inside each of us. It starts with being kinder, kinder to ourselves and kinder to every single person we meet. Make haste to be kind. Amen.